How to identify a flux control point? Well, first of all, what is a control point and what is a flux control point? So a control point represents an enzyme in a pathway where we're going to control flow, which is flux. So that's what a flux control point is. We're controlling the flow of metabolites through a metabolic pathway. Well, we've learned before that we can identify flux control points by looking for enzymes that are far equilibrium or control far equilibrium reactions. So far equilibrium reactions, these are going to be what we want to have for control points. And remembering, a far equilibrium reaction is one that is going to have a large negative delta G. Well, before we go looking for large negative delta Gs in our glycolysis uh, pathway here, I need to identify the differences between two kinds of delta Gs that we have in this table. So the first one that we have on the left is a delta G not prime. So that represents a delta G that's under standard conditions. And for uh, this situation, that's going to be 25 degrees C, one molar of all materials, and we're going to call this an ideality of uh, a situation. And so really what we have here is we've got sort of ideal conditions that if people want to compare their research experimental data, they know that they've done it all at the same conditions. And so it's comparing apples to apples, if you will. But unfortunately, we know that this is not really where biochemistry operates. So we've got delta G values that we're going to consider. And we know that we're largely operating under 37 degrees, not one molar conditions, but millimolar and sometimes micromolar conditions. And so this is the reality that we have for biochemistry. And so the reality is that we are going to be looking at delta G values. So just keep that in mind that we are not going to be considering delta G naught prime values because they don't represent the reality of the conditions that we're operating under. Okay, so we're looking for large negative delta G values that we have in a metabolic pathway. So here what we have is a table that shows us all of the reactions of glycolysis. We can see here that the 10 steps are listed, remembering that steps 6 and 7 are going to be coupled because the delta G for reaction 6 is a positive value. It is endergonic. It is non-spontaneous. We need to couple that with the following step. But if we look at the numbers that we have here, we can quickly identify that we are going to have three reactions that have large negative delta G values. So those are going to represent good control points. Well. One of these we can kind of rule out right away. So if we think about uh, reaction 10, that's not going to be a good control point because it's at the end. Remember, when we talk about metabolic pathways, I want you to be thinking about them like they're an assembly line. And a control point really represents your quality control or checkpoint manager. You don't want them checking things all the way at the end when there was a problem maybe that happened uh, earlier in your assembly process. So we really want to be controlling all of the materials that sort of come in. So controlling at the end is not going to be useful. So number 10 is not going to be good because it's the end of our metabolic pathway. So not good because it's the end of our pathway. So it might seem that number one is going to be ideal. That's at the beginning of the pathway, right? We really want to be controlling flow as we go through all 10 steps of glycolysis. But one important piece that's not obvious from what we have here is that first step in glycolysis, gly uh, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate by the enzyme hexokinase, that generates G6P, which is an important branch point metabolite. We'll use that term a lot. Branch point metabolites represent molecules that siphon out of or into metabolic pathways. And when you have that, that really represents a door that's kind of open in a way that you don't want to be controlling upstream of it. And so in this case, number one is not going to be good because we are going to have G6P be coming in and out of glycolysis after that first step. So it's not good because G6P is going to enter in and out of glycolysis after 
this step. So that kind of makes sense, right? We, we don't want to be having all of these controls in place when there's an open door that's kind of right below it. Okay, so what we really have here, and we've already talked about this already when we did our pathway walkthrough, step three is the rate controlling enzyme of glycolysis, PFK. And as we'll learn in just a little bit, remember that gluconeogenesis is the reverse of glycolysis. Little bit of a preview here. We need to find different pathways for these large negative delta Gs in order to go back up to glucose from pyruvate. So gluconeogenesis is going to have to use different enzymes and different pathways to reverse those steps. But we are also going to see that the complementary enzyme for gluconeogenesis, which is going to be FBPase, that is going to be the control point going in the opposite direction. So we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so now we know that we are going to have PFK be our control point in glycolysis. So the last little thing here is just to highlight over on this figure, it's gonna reinforce some of the things that we've already talked about. This is a little plot that kind of shows us, remember when you look at a plot, always look at your axes, it plots free energy as a function sort of of reaction progress here. And what we see is an important hallmark of things that happen in chemistry. What we see is chemistry happens to go downhill. So as we go from glucose to pyruvate, we see chemistry happening to go downhill. So chemistry happens to go downhill. Okay, and we know this, we're going downhill energetically. That's why we're able to generate two ATP. So we generate two ATP and also two NADH, right? That's a high energy molecule. It's an alternative currency. So we see these as we go through glycolysis from glucose to pyruvate. A couple of other things just to reinforce things that we've sort of seen before, right? Glucose really represents a high energy fuel Right, so we're going downhill in energy. We can see steps six and seven that we have here that re represents our coupling that we have of those two processes. And the biggest downhill jumps here represent obviously the large negative delta G values that we see, but it's that step three that is the control point for glycolysis. Last little piece here is to highlight, we are gonna spend some time learning about the reverse of this process, which is gluconeogenesis. Okay. And gluconeogenesis, just by the fear, uh, sheer fact that we can see that it's going uphill here, is indicative of the fact that that is going to be a process that requires the input of energy. Okay, and we will see that when we study glycolysis, that we're going to see the net input of ATP in order to synthesize glucose from pyruvate. All right, and that's how we can identify flux control points in glycolysis.